want to greet. Hello? Can you hear me? I think I went silent there for a minute. Uh, I want to welcome those that are joining us from our Olive Drive campus or uh, wherever you might be watching on television or a screen of some kind. Now, before we begin the message this morning, let me just say a word of uh, thank you uh, for all that uh, people in our church that have expressed praying for me and my family and my dad. Um, so many people have reached out to us, and I certainly appreciate it. We uh, went, Ginger and I, my wife and I, we went to Oklahoma where my dad still lived on the house, on the farm, the house where I grew up. And we got there about five days before he passed away. It was a sweet time with my dad as we played uh, praise music for him constantly and he worshiped the Lord. And it was just a really sweet time. Uh, my son, Andrew, and his family arrived about an hour before he passed away. And then my daughter, Faith, and Brian and their family arrived about 15 minutes before he passed away. Uh, we were all gathered around his bed, my sister and uh, her family and then our family. And one by one, people were able to say goodbye to him. Our uh, grandchildren as well were there. And then when everyone had finished saying goodbye, I knelt by his bed and uh, reminded him that he was not alone, that we were all with him, and uh, reminded him of all the people on the other side uh, that would be waiting for him and would be there, particularly our Lord. And then I had prayer for him, and then I stood up, and within three minutes or so, he took his last breath. And the Bible describes that in the Old Testament as spirit departing. My spirit is not departing, incidentally, but uh, it may sound like it, but, uh, and it being gathered to their people. And so it was really a, a, a sweet time with my dad. I appreciate your prayers. I thought since so many of you have been praying for us that I would tell you a little about my dad. I think they have a picture that they put on the screen. That was my dad when he was, uh, I think, 85, 86. He lived to be 91. Uh, his grandfather was a circuit Methodist preacher, and that meant he rode by horseback, uh, and this was in East Kentucky from uh, had pastor about five different churches, and each Sunday you would ride to a different church on a, uh, what they called a circuit. And then eventually he moved to Indian Territory and did the same thing, and that became known as the state of Oklahoma. But my dad's dad was not a preacher. He was a farmer. And so my dad grew up working hard on a farm, plowing with horses and mules in those days. And so even though it was hard work, uh, that's what he wanted to do is to farm. And so after about two years of college, he dropped out to begin as a farmer. He started out not owning any land, so he was a sharecropper, uh, which was a difficult way to make a living because you didn't really own the land. So when I was a little kid, we grew up, I grew up fairly poor. Uh, we lived in a house that uh, did not have indoor plumbing. So we had an outdoor shower, a tank really of water and uh, a outhouse. And uh, so eventually though, my dad was able to buy land of his own and made a decent living as a farmer. So he was always a hard worker and he taught me that hard work. Um, it turns out my dad was not acquainted with child labor laws. And, or at least if he was, he chose to ignore them. And so for much of my life, I thought maybe that I had to work too much too young, uh, but in the perspective of time, I've learned to appreciate that work ethic and it served me well uh, throughout uh, my life. That was my dad. He was, uh, he loved my mom from the time she was 16. They were high school sweethearts and uh, spent 65 years together. He really taught me uh, to appreciate and value uh, my wife as well. Um, my dad was a man of character. Uh, if he told you he was going to do something and shook hands with you, it didn't matter whether it was a contract or not. That was irrelevant. He was going to do what he said. 
And he was a Christian man. From the time I was a little guy, we went to church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, and every Wednesday night. I mean, every single time. I didn't realize that you had a choice <laughs> because I had no choice. I mean, we went to church, that's what we did. And on Sundays, we didn't work, even though we were on a farm, because that was a day set aside for worship. But Wednesdays was my favorite day of the week uh, because we got to quit work early in order to go to church. Uh, because church in a rural community like that isn't until 7.30 or 8 at night, uh, so you could work. But we got to quit before dark, which was really amazing for me as a little kid, uh, to be able to quit early on Wednesdays. And so I really enjoyed that. Um, but he, 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 taught, he taught me a lot of scripture and, and uh, going to church and so forth. Uh, when I started preaching, I was still in high school, and I, I don't think he was too, too convinced about that. And so the first few sermons, he wanted me to preach them for him before I preached them in a church, which is a little intimidating to preach for an audience of one, especially when it's your dad, you know, and you're in high school. But he would give me critiques on that, and uh, he didn't know anything about preaching, although he had heard a lot of preaching in his life. And so he tried to help me with that. One time he went to hear me preach, and I guess I'd preached a little longer than he thought I should. So he reminded me, he said, there's no such thing as a bad short sermon. <laughs> well, it turns out there is. I've actually heard some bad short sermons in my life, but he didn't think that there, uh, there was. Uh, we had his funeral service in a little Baptist church that he had attended for the last uh, few years. My oldest son, Matthew, gave the eulogy. Uh, and then my son Andrew did the message. Our uh, children and their spouses sang uh, one of his favorite hymns. And then my seven uh, granddaughters uh, sang I'll Fly Away, which was, uh, I know my dad would have loved that. Uh, the little building was full of people, packed. It was great to see family, some cousins that I hadn't seen for a number of years. There were friends there. Pastor Larry, who now lives in Oklahoma, wasn't able to travel, but uh, his wife Judy came. Then Pastor John Gage, that was with our church for so many years, him and his wife came. And then Pastor Gary uh, Mathena flew from Virginia to be with our family. And uh, it was just a, a blessing. During my high school years, uh, I rebelled for a period of few years against the values and the faith of my dad. But I've, I've come to greatly appreciate the legacy of faith that's been handed to me, not only by my dad and my mom, but by generations and generations of uh, Christian people before them. So thank you for praying for our family. We certainly appreciate it. Now I want you to open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 26. Uh, we are continuing today, we're kind of backfilling what we missed, but we're continuing our series of messages verse by verse through the Gospel of Matthew. We're looking at a message today that I'm calling Betrayed by a Friend. The last week of Jesus' life on earth was filled with activity and certainly with suffering at the end. But something happened the night before he was crucified that I want us to consider. Jesus, along with his 12 disciples, they rented a room that was upstairs over a residence. We call it the upper room. And they observed together the Passover meal. Jesus, as you know, transformed the Passover meal for you and I as believers forever into what we call the Lord's Supper. That night in the upper room, Jesus had a number of personal conversations with the 12. I want us to consider today the personal conversation that he had with Judas. But I, I want us to look at something that happened earlier that e, uh, than, than that evening. This is in Matthew 26, verse 14. Then one of the 12, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him, Jesus, to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. So from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. Then verse number 20. When evening to come, now they're in the upper room. When evening to come, he sat down with the 12. 
Now as they were eating, he said, As surely I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? And answer said, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes, just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, or teacher, is it I? And he said, you have said it. Have you ever noticed how some proper names have made their way into our dictionary? Or at least into the popular vernacular of our culture today? Uh, they, they've taken on, on a meaning of their own. For instance, if you call a woman a Jezebel, in Christian circles, that has a certain connotation or meaning. In popular culture, if you call someone a Benedict Arnold, then we understand the meaning of that. Or a Casanova, or a Don Juan, or Brutus, or certainly Judas Iscariot. To call someone a Judas means that they uh, perhaps betrayed you, or they're disingenuous, they are phony of some kind. It's certainly not a compliment, is it? Judas is the most famous traitor or was the most famous traitor of all times. Now, Judas was a very popular name during the time of Jesus. We can identify at least six men in the New Testament that were named Judas. It was a beautiful name. It literally meant praise to God. Yet to the modern ear, Judas is kind of an ugly name. In Christian circles, you're never going to go over to our nursery and, and with a new baby, ask your young mom what their, the baby's name is, and they proudly say, Judas. And his middle name is Iscariot. <laughs> it's never going to happen. Now, I, I want though to kind of expand our study from Matthew 26 and 27 in a more general look at the life of Judas. The reason is, I, I don't know about you, but I'm perplexed by the life of Judas. Here was a man who had heard virtually every sermon Jesus ever preached. He saw nearly all the miracles, and yet he betrayed our Lord. The New Testament tells us that the night before Jesus chose the 12, that he spent the entire night in prayer, and yet he still chose Judas Iscariot. Incidentally, Iscariot is not his middle name. It simply means man from Carrot. It identifies his hometown. He was the only one of the 12 that was not a Galilean. He was from further south of the, of the tribe of Judah. Uh, but the big question is this. Did Jesus know when he chose him what kind of man Judas was? I believe he did. Listen, listen to what John tells us. This, this is in John chapter 6 and verse number 64. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. When did Jesus find out about the betrayal of Judas? Was it in the Garden of Gethsemane when Judas embraced him and kissed him on the cheek? No. John says that he knew from the beginning. So the bigger question is this. Why did he call him to be one of his close followers. Well, it was the will of God. I mean, he'd prayed the night before all night about it. It's ridiculous to think that somehow Jesus missed the will of the Father. So here's the dilemma. Why did he call him knowing he would betray him? There are several possible solutions that people have come up with through the centuries. Some people have seen Judas as a victim that someone had to betray Jesus. It was prophesied in the Old Testament that he'd be betrayed by a friend, and so that God simply used him according to this theory, that God manipulated him, that he was a pawn in the hand of God. There's a lot of movies about the life of Jesus that they, they portray Judas in, in that way. Uh, there was a popular movie about the life of Jesus in the 1970s that was a musical called Jesus Christ Superstar. And in the movie, Judas is actually one of the primary characters. And it, it was a musical, and I hate to admit it, but Judas, the guy that played Judas, was probably the best singer in the movie. But uh, those of you that are old enough to remember that movie, there, there was a scene where Judas was about to betray Jesus, and he's out in the barren landscape of the desert, and, and all of a sudden, over the horizon comes army tanks chasing Judas, and he's running. And there are jet airplanes that come across the desert, 
uh, floor. Now, it's set in biblical times, but there are army tanks and there's jets. Jesus Christ Superstar was not exactly biblically accurate, okay? It was a musical. And, and they were saying in the imagery that Judas was driven by force greater than himself. The implication was that God was doing this, that, that, that Judas was a mere robot, and that, that robs him of his humanity. It certainly robs him of any responsibility. It makes Judas a victim and God the villain. Was Judas a, a puppet on the string that God was somehow pleased with what he did? No. Listen to Judas' own interpretation of these events. This is the words of Judas and himself in, in uh, Matthew 27, verse 1. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, the betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. But the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, it is not lawful to put them into the treasury because they are the price of blood. And they sold to, consulted together and brought uh, bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in it. Therefore, that field has been uh, called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what was written by Jeremiah the prophet saying, and they took the 30 pieces of silver, the value of him who was priced, whom they of the children of Israel priced, and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. They were so magnanimous. They took the money and gave it to the poor after demanding the life of Jesus. But Judas, after the betrayal, did not say, hey, I didn't have a choice. I'm a victim. I was driven by a force greater than myself. God did this. No, he took responsibility, at least to a degree, when he said, I have sinned. In fact, he felt the weight of that so much, he committed suicide. So was the betrayal the plan of God? Yes. Was Judas responsible? Yes. Now, it's hard to understand, isn't it? That's, that's what we call a paradox. A paradox is something that is an, an apparent contradiction. And there are many paradoxes in the Bible. For instance, God elects people to salvation, yet we are responsible to come to him in faith. That's a paradox. We see the paradox, particularly a, a different, the paradox with Judas in the conversation that, that Jesus had uh, with Judas in uh, Matthew 26, verse 24, when he, Jesus said, the Son of Man indeed goes as it was written of him, but woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be better if he had not been born. There are two thoughts in the mind of Jesus the night of his betrayal. One, that it was predestined and the will and the plan of the Father that he would be betrayed. And yet, there was human responsibility because he said, woe to the man who does it. Those two things cannot easily be reconciled in a finite mind because they're a paradox. There are other paradoxes in the Bible. How do you reconcile the paradox of salvation? The Bible says, chosen in him before the foundation of the world. And yet the Bible says, whosoever will, Make up. Yet the Bible says none wills to be saved. The Bible says there is none that seek after God, no not one. The Bible says no one comes to the Father unless the Spirit draws them. How do we reconcile the fact that we're responsible to come to God in faith, but we cannot come unless God draws us? It really depends on how you look at salvation. If you look at salvation through the view and the prism of God the Father, you'll always come up with election chosen in him before the foundation of the world because God in his sovereignty knows. But if you look at salvation from a very human perspective, you'll come up with responsibility and faith. I chose, yet I was chosen. Which is true? They are both true. But perhaps Judas is... One of the greatest of all paradoxes, he is a guy or was a guy just like us. He put his pants on one leg at a time like we do. Well, he probably didn't wear pants. He wore a robe, but he, he was a guy, you know. But was Jesus a victim? No. 
That, that somehow makes a devil out of God. That means that God solicited him to do wrong. That violates everything that we know about who God is. James, for instance, in James chapter 1, verse 13 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted of evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. God does not solicit anyone to do evil. If God put in the heart of Judas to betray Jesus, then God initiated sin because the betrayal was a sin. So Judas was not a victim. Others have seen Judas as somehow a hero, or he thought he was a hero. He's depicted that, off, that way often in movies about Jesus, that all he wanted to do was force Jesus to be the king. There were many people anticipating uh, including the disciples somewhat, that Jesus was a political Messiah. The reasoning in this theory goes something like this. Judas was a political zealot. Jesus seemed to be the best hope politically for them. Judas saw the popularity of Jesus at all-time high that week with a triumphal entry, and he thought, if I have him arrested, it will force the issue. There will be a political insurrection, a revolt against Rome, and Jesus will lead that revolt. He'll free us from the boot and the oppression of the pesky Romans. Now, in that theory, all Judas is guilty of is being naive. That his scheme backfired, he felt bad about it, and he committed suicide. Now, there's a problem with this theory. The problem is this. For three years, Judas had been with Jesus. He had heard the teaching of Jesus. Jesus over and over again had said he was not a political Messiah. He had declared again and again, my kingdom is not of this world. That the kingdom that he was talking about was not political, it was spiritual. In fact, for a number of weeks, when, when you're leading up to that last week of his life, those events, Jesus had already said, I don't know how many times he had said, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to suffer, and I'm going to die, and I'm going to be resurrected. Jesus had defined his messianic mission over and over again as being spiritual, not political. He had repelled the idea of being a king. Jesus was not somehow vacillating that needed to be prompted by Judas or anyone else to be a king. King. So Judas was not a victim. Judas was certainly not a hero. Others have said, well, Judas was apostate. He was a true follower of Jesus, a man of faith who fell from grace. No. Judas was never saved to begin with. Now, Judas had likely been with Jesus from the beginning. And likely he'd been baptized by John the Baptist because after he committed suicide, the other 11 got together after the resurrection and they said, we need to choose someone to take Judas's place. So it's got to be someone that was baptized by John as they had been. And it's got to be someone that was here with us from the beginning. The implication is that Judas was a follower of John the Baptist and he'd been set apart uh, uh, to follow Jesus. But listen to what Jesus said in his prayer in John 17. He said, while I was with them in the world, the disciples, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Jesus is not making a statement of failure when he says none is lost except Judas. And your, your translation say, may say but or except. Either way you translate it, it's not a conjunction in this context. It's a disjunctive. It designates those who belong to two different classes. We use the word except that way sometimes ourselves. We say dogs eat meat, but cows eat grass. We're not saying those two things are similar. We're saying they are different. We're not saying that cows used to eat meat, and now they eat grass. We're saying they have never eaten meat. They have always eaten grass. Jesus was distinguishing between those I have kept and this one over here who has never been a part of me. In fact, he said he was the son of perdition, implying from the beginning that he was never part of Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm glad that Jesus was not surprised by the betrayal of Judas, that he was not victimized. John tells us in his gospel that Jesus willingly laid down his life for us. It was his choice. He was not somehow manipulated by the Jews or politically driven by Judas. In an act of his own volition, his own sovereign will, he gave his life. Now, the betrayal of Judas had been prophesied in the Old Testament. 
Listen to Psalm 41, which is a messianic psalm. Even my own familiar friend, and it's in the voice of the Messiah, even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. And then Psalm 55, for it is not an enemy who reproaches me, then I could bear it. Nor is it one who hates me, uh, who has exalted himself against me, then I could hide from him. But it was you, a man my equal, my companion, my acquaintance, we took sweet counsel together and walked to the house of God in the throng. The prophecy was that whoever betrayed Jesus would be someone that was in the throng of people climbing the steps of the temple. And that was Judas. Every time Jesus went to the temple, his followers were climbing that steps with him. Judas was his follower. And Zechariah said that he would be betrayed, Jesus or the Messiah would, for 30 pieces of silver. That's the price that Judas was paid. Judas was an awful man disingenuous in his faith. But God in his sovereignty not only rules, but overrules. So was Judas a believer? No, never. He was committed on one level. He hung around for three years. He appeared to be a believer, but he really wasn't. He was disingenuous in his faith, and he wasn't the only one like that. I mean, in the beginning, in, in the north, in Galilee, there were thousands upon thousands of people that followed Jesus. Uh, and they followed him many times for the bread because he had fed the multitudes. But in John chapter 6, it says, from that time on, many of the disciples walked with him no more. And the word disciples there is many of the learners. That's when Jesus finally got down to the nitty gritty of what it meant to be a follower of Christ and uh, to be a, a, a true believer. And many said, hey, I'm out of here. I didn't sign up for this. I want the free food. I'm here for the gift bag. You know, I, I want to see a miracle, but I'm God. And, and that was Judas. His commitment was not spiritual. It was material. It was more like, his commitment was more like what we call today the prosperity gospel. He was all about what's in it for him. We gain insight into his betrayal from an event that happened just a few days before. Over the hill or the Mount of Olives, there was a village called Bethany. And one of Jesus' friends lived there by the name of Lazarus. He had two sisters, Mary and Martha. And he visited them in their home. And Martha took a costly bottle of perfume and poured it on the feet of Jesus, anointing him for his burial. So they got it. They understood that he was going to die. And it's one of the greatest acts of worship in the New Testament. And we know exactly how Judas responded to that. John chapter 12. But one of the, his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, one who would betray him, said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. Now there's Judas' true character. He was not a man of faith at all. He's been stealing, skimming off the top. He's the guy with the money bag, the purse strings. So he's been taking the collection and, and stealing it for himself. And, and so he's, he's upset. Mary has just given one of the greatest acts of worship in the Bible, and Judas is mad about it. It was such a great act of worship, I think, that, that when she broke open that bottle of perfume, the fragrance would have filled the entire house. In fact, I think a few days later, when Jesus was carrying the cross on the Via della Rosa, if you would have been standing close enough, you would have smelled the sweet fragrance of Mary's worship. Matthew chapter 26, verse 8 says, When the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? Now, Matthew doesn't identify that it was Judas, but you can hear his voice in that from the other Gospels. Now, there's some irony in this, and you don't really get it in English, but in the original language of the New Testament, the word waste is the same word as perdition. Jesus called him the son of perdition. Judas said, you have wasted the money. Later, Jesus said, your whole life is a waste. You're the son of waste. Judas was drawn to Jesus in the beginning politically, but he stayed for the money. Judas had seen all the miracles, heard all the sermons. He was there when the lepers were healed. He was there and saw the crippled men walk, the blind could see. He was there when Jesus walked on the water, and astoundingly, his faith was not real. You say, well, there's no one like that today. 
that's just following Jesus for what they can get? You don't think? I hear preachers all the time on the radio or television saying if you give $100, God's going to give you 1000 back. That makes our giving not about generosity but about greed. There's a lot of people today that are following Jesus for what they think they can get out of it. That was Judas. He sees the prosperity coming to the end. There's not going to be anything to steal. He's reading the signs he, uh, uh, that Jesus is going to die, so he meets with the chief priest, and, and uh, he sees that it's going to be a train wreck by the end of the week, that Jesus is going to die, so he sees one last chance to profit. And this is not just an act of betrayal and a moment of passion. The Bible says he conferred with the chief priest. It is our word bargain. Maybe he started high and said, I'll betray him. You know, for 50 pieces of silver, they say, no, 20. And then they say, 30, done. And he became the traitor. In the early morning hours, while it was still dark, the soldiers led by Judas go to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus was praying. The soldiers had never seen Jesus he had spent most of his life in the north in Galilee. They didn't know what he looked like. But there was a signal that had been prearranged. This is in Matthew 26. We'll pick it up in verse number 48. Matthew 26, 48. Now his betrayer had given them a sign saying, whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Another gospel account says that when he kissed Jesus, Jesus said, Must you betray me with a kiss? I think if you'd been nearby in the moonlight, you might have seen Jesus' eyes filled with tears when he said it. The psychology of Judas to me. Is a, it's an enigma, a mystery, a puzzle, a riddle. How can you listen to John the Baptist, the greatest of all the prophets, Jesus said, and be lost? How can you hear the Sermon on the Mount in person and be lost and hear all the parables and be lost? But that, that's Judas. There's a lot of paintings that have been done throughout history of Jesus and his disciples. And most of the paintings, you can easily pick out Judas. Because he's always seems to be painted in dark colors and shadows or a scowl in his face. In medieval times, Judas was even painted with stubby little horns. <laughs> so you could easily locate who Judas was. But that was not Judas. In his external reputation, he looked like a, an apostle. Because the night of the Passover, Jesus said, someone's going to betray me. And one, one by one, the disciples said, is it I? Is it I? They didn't say, oh, yeah, it's that guy with horns. That's who's going to do it. He always has a scowl in his face. No, he seemed normal. He seemed to be a person of faith. They even elected him, or at least somehow he became the treasure. I assume that he preached messages like the other apostles. Everything seemed right on the outside, but it was a facade. He was a fake. Matthew 27, 3. Judas, the betrayer, seeing that he'd been condemned, was remorseful and brought the 30 pieces of silver back to the chief priest and to the elders. Now, he didn't repent. He was remorseful. He regretted it. He felt bad. He wanted to relieve his conscience, so he brought the money back. But it, but it was not an act of faith. I mean, there's no time in human history where people express genuine faith and God saved them and changed their life and their next act was an act of utter despair. He regrets. I mean, what drug addict doesn't regret the first drug or what drunkard doesn't re regret the first drink or what prostitute doesn't regret the path they chose? And he was sorry for the consequence. He said, I betrayed innocent blood. Now, what's the application for you and I? Here's the first principle. We must purposely develop a worldview based upon biblical truth. Everyone has a worldview. That is a filter or a lens, a prism through which we see life itself. For Christians, our primary filter through which we view the world should be biblical truth. That was not the case for Judas. His filter was self-interest and greed. 
And sadly, that's true of many people in our culture today. But Judas, I think, also had a political ideology as a primary filter. He thought the Messiah would be a political leader who would free them from the Romans. Now, all of us today have a political ideology. Even if we're not affiliated with a political party, we are social beings. And so it's appropriate that we would hold to some kind of political ideology and defend that and support that, particularly in a democracy, that, that's our responsibility. But no matter what our political ideology is, truth, biblical truth, should be our primary filter. But that's changing rapidly in the Western world for Christians. Sometimes people today will change churches because of politics. But when is the last time you heard someone change politics because of their church? It rarely happens because many Christians' primary filter has become political ideology, not biblical truth. So they search for a church that will validate their political persuasion. And it doesn't matter. I'm not talking about whether right wing, left wing, or centrist politics. Uh, they, they support a group that will support their political ideology rather than biblical truth. Now, as Christians today and as a church, we're not united by a shared political ideology because we vary in that. We're united by our faith in Christ. Judas viewed Jesus through a political lens. Judas wanted Jesus as a leader to rail against the government of his time, perhaps even lead a revolt in order to restore the rights and the freedoms that had been lost to an oppressive government. And Jesus challenged Judas' ideology of both greed and political rights as being secondary to spiritual truth when he said, my kingdom is not of this world. And sadly, Judas ultimately chose ideology over truth. Here's the second principle. Judas testified to the sinlessness of Jesus. Judas is the ultimate insider. He's been with, he'd been with Jesus for three years. The Pharisees were looking for dirt on Jesus. If anyone could dish dirt on Jesus, it would have been Judas, right? If there were any skeletons in Jesus' closet, any, any sin, any little juicy bit of gossip, it would have been trumpeted by Judas. But that's not the case. Right before he died, he said, I have betrayed innocent blood. There is not a greater enemy in human history of Jesus than Judas. And yet out of his mouth, he declares Jesus to be sinless. Here's the next principle. The message of the gospel will not be stopped by false teachers. That gives me great comfort, and it should all of us. Because I hear false teachers everywhere. I hear people perverting the message of the gospel and of the Bible, getting things completely out of balance. And I, I'm grieved by that. And if I'm grieved by that, imagine how that grieves the great heart of God. Yet the church, at its very inception, the very beginning had a traitor in their midst. One of the 12. But that did not stop the work of God. Now, false teachers may lead many people astray, but they will not stop the gospel. The Bible tells us that someday in heaven, there'll be people from every tribe, from every race, from every language that will be singing to the Lamb of God. The gospel will not be stopped. I mean, all of us today, any thinking person today is concerned about the rapid decay of the morals in our culture, but I'm telling you, it does not matter how much the culture decays. The gospel will not be stopped. The message of God will never be silenced. But here's the next point of application. Many who appear to be Christians are in fact not. It's a sad statement, but true. Isn't that what Jesus said as he comes near the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount in, in uh, Matthew chapter 7, when he said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you practice lawlessness. You can be moral and not be spiritual. It's possible to have all the trappings of Christianity, even come to church, 
and not have a relationship with God. The same sun that melts wax often hardens clay. People come to church and they hear a message and their heart is melted by the Holy Spirit, but the same message can harden other people to the gospel. You can go to hell from a church house the same as you can from a honky-tonk, my friend. That's why we need to examine ourselves and make sure that we're really of the faith. One last principle. God can use even failure to accomplish his will. The greatness of the sovereignty of God is that Judas, he did not wreck the plan of God. He actually fulfilled the plan of God. God can take bad things and work it together for good. Now, nothing in our lives is likely as bad as the betrayal of Judas. That stands in history as one of the greatest of all sin. But the sovereignty of God is that he can take even bad things that are in our life and work them together for good if we submit ourselves to him. If God could bring good out of something as horrendous As the betrayal of Judas, imagine what it can do with our failures if we simply bring them to Jesus and cry out for his forgiveness.